The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Yudit Barkan. Um, I am the president-elect of the American Society of Cytopathology, and uh, we are happy that you could join us either uh, live via the webinar series or from our YouTube channel. If you're already here listening to the YouTube, you know uh, what, to, uh, what channel to subscribe to. Uh, but let me repeat it again. It's the Cytopath 1952, and 1952 is when ASC was founded, which is why uh, that's our um, uh, name here. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a cytopathologist and a genitourinary pathologist. I am originally Turkish. I went to medical school in Turkey. I have uh, two teenager girls at home, uh, one of which you'll see some artwork that I uh, dispersed throughout the PowerPoint. And uh, before I start, um, I would like to uh, thank everyone at the ASC, Ms. Jenkins, uh, Ms. Joanne Jenkins and Beth Jenkins in helping us uh, put this together, as well as all the other faculty who have um, helped uh, give the lectures. Um, I wish everyone um, safe and healthy time in this uh, pandemic, um, and I um, really hope you enjoy some urine cytology here. So let's go on. You're in Wonderland. Now, what are the usual suspects in urine cytology? On the uh, left hand here, you see a bladder biopsy. You see some uh, mucosa on top, some lemina propria, and some uh, dispersed red blood cells. When we look at the mucosa, we see uh, at the very bottom the basal cells lining the mucosa. And then we have some intermediate cells in the middle. And on the very top, we have the superficial or the umbrella cells. So when there is a bladder washing or a bladder barbatized sample, or even uh, when there's voided urine, what we can see are typically the superficial or the umbrella cells. Here you see them in a cluster uh, because this was a bladder washing specimen and uh, they typically come out in clusters. Now in voided urines, you can see them singly. What you see is either uh, mononucleated cells or sometimes binucleated and sometimes multinucleated um, umbrella cells. If it's a instrumented urine, again like a barbitage, you can also see intermediate or basal cells, the ones at the very bottom. Uh, and here you see uh, cells with high NC ratio, but the nuclei are not that large. They do come in clusters because of the instrumented nature of the specimen. Now, what else can we see? Um, sometimes the bladder has cystitis glandularis or cystitis cystica. Here we see some glandular metaplasia on the bladder biopsy, and this, what we would see on urine samples, would be glandular cells. Here they're full of mucin, and the uh, nucleus is pushed towards the very edge here. Now, in the second picture below, you see a bladder biopsy specimen with squamous metaplasia. When do we see squamous metaplasia in bladders? We see it when there is indwelling catheters, or we see it when there is uh, perhaps an outflow tract obstruction or stones, um, urolithiasis. So these would be the reasons why you would see that. And how do we see these on uh, urine samples are just squamous cells. Now in voided urine samples, you might see squamous cells more often. Um, it could be coming from the genital tract in that case. What are different specimen types of urine cytology? Voided urine, obviously one of the most common ones. Um, and it's easy to get to. And then we could have instrumented urine samples, like catheterized urine. This could be self-catheterized or catheterized in the office. Um, others are bladder washing or barbatized samples uh, directed towards the uh, bladder. It could be the upper tract washing or brushing samples, or it could be the very lower tract with urethral washing and brushing samples. Um, so all of these have pros and cons to themselves, and just quickly uh, thinking about it, voided urines are very easy to get to. So the patient doesn't have to go through a procedure. It's very easy to get the uh, uh, specimen. However, uh, it's not as cellular, and also you could see a lot of degeneration in these samples. 
instrumented urines, however, are happen to be more cellular, and uh, there's much less degeneration. You see more intact cells. You can see clusters and groups. Um, however, the patient has to go through some sort of procedure to get these. So those would be the um, uh, the downsides of these instrumented urines. And and of these, the upper tract or the urethra washing could be called a selective site. I mean, they are particularly looking at that uh, site. And this would happen if they're actually worried about it um, on radiology, for instance. So with that introduction, let's go into our case number one. Case number one is a 59-year-old gentleman. He presents with a recent episode of gross hematuria lasting two days. Past medical history, uh, he has a kidney stone five years ago in, in addition to hypothyroidism and hypertension. Now, what I'm showing you here is a bladder barbitage specimen. Most of our cases are actually bladder barbitage cases. So here you see uh, three different pictures. And in the three different pictures, you see cells of varying sizes and shapes. You see smaller cells. And you see much, much larger cells here. You see a background of red blood cells. Now, this uh, particular sample was prepared with the cytospin method. And therefore, you see more red blood cells in the background. And also, you tend to see more clustering. Here, you could see some cells with relatively high nuclear cytoplasmic ratio, uh, with some of the nuclei occupying more than 50%, approaching maybe 70% of the cytoplasm. Some of the other areas have uh, nuclear hyperchromasia, like this and like this. And you see some nuclear membrane irregularity in all of these. And we see some uh, perhaps more closer to normal looking urethelial cells in the background. So what would be the diagnosis on a case like this? Negative for high-grade urethelial carcinoma uh, without any qualifier. Negative for high-grade urethelial carcinoma with poliomavirus qualifier. Atypical urethelial cells. Suspicious for high-grade urethelial carcinoma and high-grade urethelial carcinoma. Now, since this is a uh, re-recording of the original uh, section, uh, we had done a polling during the um, original presentation uh, of the webinar. And uh, we had over 800 attendees, and about 400 of them replied to this question. And as you see, the vast majority of them picked high-grade urethelial carcinoma, followed by suspicious for high-grade urethelial carcinoma. Now, let's see if the original attendees were right. So, um, what is the approach to something like this? What are we seeing here? We're seeing larger cells in urine cytology. And this lecture is meant to be a practical approach to urine cytology. What happens when you see large cells, small cells, glandular cells, and so forth? So, what is the differential diagnosis of large cells in urine cytology? Now, could they be normal or reactive urethelial cells? As you know, umbrella cells are relatively large. Is it that? Is it a reactive umbrella cell? Poliomavirus effect could be seen. Sometimes you see some uh, larger cells in poliomavirus. Um, other viruses, seminal vesicle cells, uh, treatment or chemotherapy effect, high-grade urethelial carcinoma, and others are squamous cell carcinoma, and so forth. Now let's look at these one by one. First one we see here is a poliomavirus effect. You see a single cell here with eccentrically located uh, nucleus. Uh, the nuclear contours are very clear. Uh, there are not much irregularity. Maybe there's a slight nuclear beading on the edges, but there's a ground glass kind of appearance here. Sometimes uh, with these cells, if you go up and down with the microfocus, you can see a spider web-like pattern uh, within the uh, nucleus, too. Um, the one thing is, although they could be hyperchromatic, typically you do not see any nuclear membrane irregularity or nuclear contour irregularity on these cases. This looks like a, this is also called a decoy cell, uh, which was a uh, term coined by Mr. Ritchie, who was uh, Dr. Kosa's cytotechnologist. They worked together, and they were, because he said it was a, a 
dicoi, uh, like people could think that these are high-grade urothelial carcinoma. So there's a little bit of history for you there. Um, other viruses uh, could mimic high-grade urothelial carcinoma cells, and let's uh, start from the one in the middle, the herpes. So we all know, those of you, um, you know, having gone through cytology rotations, you see the herpes, the 3M of herpes, with the multinucleation. As you see, there's multiple nuclei and margination of the chromatinic material to the nuclear contour. Um, and so multinucleation, margination, and molding of the uh, nuclei to one another. So if you see something like that anywhere in any cytology material, you would know that this is herpes virus. Now, of course, the nucleus looks enlarged, but you do recognize this way, the um, nuclear features and the uh, viral uh, inclusions. Similar to that is the cytomegalovirus, where you see nuclear inclusions not only in the nucleus here, but you see it also in the cytoplasm. So the cell is perhaps enlarged, the nuclei is perhaps enlarged, but you do recognize the viral particles in the two areas, and you know that this is not it. And adenovirus is um, very similar, actually, in appearance to the uh, cytomegalovirus, where you see these um, inclusions um, in, the, in the cell. So these could be mimickers of uh, urothelial carcinoma. Now, another mimicker is the seminal vesicle cell. Um, seminal vesicles uh, could look rather pleomorphic and quote unquote ugly, if you will. Why? Because they could be um, pleomorphic. They have hyperchromasia. Uh, they have maybe irregular nuclear contours. However, there are some telltale signs of these that you can differentiate these from high-grade urothelial carcinoma. Number one, the company they keep, um, sperm. You're lucky if you do see sperm in the sample and you're like, okay, these are uh, seminal vesicle cells. Second, if you look closely to the cytoplasm, you could see some pigmentation, and this is the lipofusion pigmentation of the seminal vesicle cells. Again, this would be the telltale sign that this is not a high-grade urothelial carcinoma. Now, uh, next would be uh, urolithiasis. In cases of urolithiasis, uh, what you typically would see would be clusters and groups of cells. You're not going to see much of a nuclear enlargement or nuclear contour abnormalities. So if you can imagine the mucosa is sitting there happily and then there's a stone rubbing and rubbing at the mucosa. And what happens is that's almost like an instrumentation artifact. Uh, the mucosa comes up in clusters, in chunks, and you can even see a little bit of a colorette around these. Like you see a little bit of a color around these cells, making this almost a pseudopapillary cluster, and the reason why I'm using the verb or the um, adjective pseudopapillary is that we don't really see true fibrovascular cores making this um, a, uh, um, a uh, low-grade urothelial neoplasm. Okay, so next, let's see, um, is the treatment effect. And you know what treatment effect perhaps looks like in um, PAP tests. Uh, where you see these vacuolated cytoplasm and polychromasia and some vacuoles here you could see there's maybe some slight change in the color of the uh, uh, cells um, and you could see some uh, pleomorphism too. So these are umbrella cells uh, that have gone through chemotherapy effect and therefore they look like what is going on? They're kind of reacting. If you will, it's an exaggerated uh, reaction or reactive process. Uh, this picture was my uh, from my late mentor, Dr. Barney Naylor, as was some of the um, uh, viral pictures there too. Always remember him very fondly. Um, so the next differential diagnosis um, could be lymphoma. Now, as you know, lymphomas anywhere in the body um, are discohesive. They like social distancing. They don't like hanging out together. And that is a good thing about lymphomas. I suppose we should be all this social distancing in these days. So here in these pictures, you see these single cells dispersed about the um, sample. Um, 
they also have higher nuclear cytoplasmic ratio. They could have prominent nucleoli. Uh, sometimes they could have close chromatin pattern. Here you see a vesicular chromatin pattern. Uh, this was a anaplastic large cell lymphoma. It's re relatively large, so these large cell lymphomas could be in the differential of large cells seen in urine cytology. Um, sometimes um, the most common type of uh, lymphoma seen in the bladder would be a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. However, you could see other kinds of lymphoma, uh, like a small cell lymphoma, which we would see um, in our uh, small cell differential too. Uh, then comes, of course, melanoma. And this is something to know wherever in the body you are. Uh, this could be a primary melanoma or a metastatic melanoma. Now, they do have also eccentrically located nuclei. Sometimes they have a uh, very high NC ratio. Sometimes they have more of an ample cytoplasm. Here they look epithelial or epithelioid, if you will, uh, but sometimes melanomas could appear spindled too. One of the telltale signs probably for this would be if you have the uh, pigmentation. You can see the pigmentation in the cytoplasm, sort of a darker brown pigmentation. In addition to these cherry red prominent nucleoli, these would be the giveaway for that. Now, I don't recommend you jumping at every cell with a prominent nucleoli um, in urine cytology as this, could this be melanoma? However, um, keep it in the back of your mind, low on your differential diagnosis, um, in case there is actually a melanoma involving the bladder or the urethra. So this particular case actually was a high-grade urethelial carcinoma. Uh, and why was it? Because of the high nuclear cytoplasmic ratio, the hyperchromasia, um, the irregular nuclear contours, and this is a cytospin preparation. Uh, below it is a thin prep. Again, you see the very high NC ratios of the cells. You have a little bit of a tail even coming out of this particular cell, and you see how coarse and clumped the chromatin pattern is. Uh, next to it is a transurethral resection um, of this uh, patient where you could see uh, the tumors totally involving the, um, uh, well, actually, you don't see the lamina propria, but you see um, very high mitotic rate, and you're seeing these large sheets and nests of tumor cells, so high-grade urethelial carcinoma. So let's review what are the features of high-grade urethelial carcinoma. These samples tend to be rather cellular. Why? Because unlike normal urethelial cells, high-grade urethelial cells, fall into the urine uh, with much more ease. You could see single cells or you could see cells in groups, especially if this is a papillary lesion, you could have um, tumor fall out in chunks and clusters into the urine. Um, what's the shape of these cells? Irregular plasmacytoid, meaning eccentrically located cytoplasm. They could be pleomorphic. Now, bottom four, as you see, I've highlighted. These are important to remember. Um, nuclear enlargement is one of the bigger things. So there has to be some nuclear enlargement with an increased nuclear cytoplasmic ratio. And I put it down here as more than 0 0.7. Um, there's a long story behind it. Um, but just the short of the story is when you say high NC ratio, how high is high? Just to give it a quantitative reason of what high would mean. So if anything is more than 0 0.7, it would be a high NC ratio. Now, in addition to that, you do want to see coarse chromatin, hyperchromasia, and irregular nuclear contours or nuclear membrane. So those are the features, and this is something important to remember. Now, here's another uh, problem when it comes to urine cytology, and we do see these sometimes. What do we do with squamous cells in urine cytology? So we have three pictures in here. Here we see some atypical squamous cells, correct? If you saw this in, say, a pap smear, you might call this, oh, is this a low grade because there's binucleation, maybe there's a halo, there's coilocytic change or coilocytes, if you will. Um, so clearly dysplastic squamous cells. The second picture, you see some dysplastic squamous cells, some dyskeratotic cells, but also you see some maybe urethelial cells uh, that are highly atypical. And on the third picture, I'm just showing you um, very, very atypical um, squamous cells. So how can we handle these? What do we do now? And perhaps what are the changes that would come with the uh, 
um, second uh, edition of the Paris system. So the first one, we see dysplastic squamous cells, normal urothelial cells. These dysplastic squamous cells could be coming if it's a male from the penile urethra or if it's a female from the uh, genital tract. Say this is avoided urine, this is something that could be seen. So here we would say um, that there are dysplastic squamous cells. Uh, the final uh, report would be dysplastic squamous cells present and, and with a note that where is it coming from? It could be coming from the genital tract, but that you don't see any high-grade urothelial carcinoma. In the second scenario, when you see dysplastic squamous cells plus maybe malignant urothelial cells, then you could say, well, this is urothelial carcinoma, high-grade urothelial carcinoma with some squamous differentiation, or it could be a poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. It's difficult. So here you would say that there's a carcinoma with squamous differentiation uh, with a comment saying this could be a high-grade with high-grade urothelial carcinoma with squamous differentiation. However, a, um, a poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma cannot be um, entirely excluded. Same thing with the second one, when you see all these malignant squamous cells, uh, the thought process is that it's probably a primary squamous cell carcinoma, but remember this is urine cytology, it's not the entire bladder, perhaps there's a urothelial carcinoma in somewhere in there hiding. So again, the, uh, the idea of the diagnosis would be uh, that this is a carcinoma with squamous differentiation with a differential diagnosis, including squamous cell carcinoma, primary versus a urothelial carcinoma with extensive squamous differentiation. Now, next up, what I want to show you is the uh, different kinds of uh, preparations perhaps look a little bit different. Here in this uh, three images, I'm showing you the three different kinds of uh, preparations. We have sure path, cytospin, and thin prep. Now, um, in a uh, College of American Pathologist survey that we um, sent out, uh, in the U.S. mainly, um, thin prep is most commonly used, about maybe 60% or so of the time, followed by cytospin preparation, followed by sure path. Um, now, why is this important? Um, it is important to see when we're doing the uh, reporting and the criteria, we have to be used to our own preparation system. And if there's criteria published, how does that involve uh, the particular uh, preparation type that we're using. The two preparations, thin prep and sure path, are monolayer. Therefore, you tend to see more um, single cells, more dispersion, um, in addition to less of a background. So here, you don't see much of a background in the thin prep, and same thing with the uh, sure path. Because of the processing, sure path tends to be a little bit more uh, darker um, or hypochromatic, if you will. Um, compared to the uh, cytospins, where you're just concentrating it on a um, small area on the slide, the concentrating the slide on a small area of the slide, you could see more three-dimensional structures and also you see some background. Now that said, um, according to a study that uh, we did at Loyola University, and we did split samples looking at cytospin and thin prep, which is what we do in our own laboratory, we found out that uh, really for detecting high-grade urothelial carcinoma, there was not much of a difference in terms of the NC ratio and the hyperchromasia. Um, so with that, let me ask everyone, uh, what preparation type do you use for urine specimens in your laboratory? Uh, again, since this is a uh, re-recorded uh, webinar, I actually have the answers uh, for what um, the original attendees had said. Uh, and it looks like, uh, similar to what the College of American Pathologists survey that we had sent, about 60% um, of the um, individuals on the uh, webinar actually did the thin prep, uh, followed by cytospin and followed by sure path. Maybe there's some others, about 1% of uh, other uh, specimen types too. So how do we report uh, urine cytology? And um, as you know, the Paris System of Reporting uh, Urine Cytology was published in uh, 2015. Uh, the book came out in 2016. And uh, the recording system is a, uh, or the reporting system uh, rather, uh, is a tiered reporting. 
So we have start with unsatisfactory or non-diagnostic. Um, goes on with negative for high-grade urethelial carcinoma. Uh, notice it doesn't say negative for malignancy. It says negative for high-grade urethelial carcinoma, uh, followed by typical urethelial cells, and then it's suspicious for high-grade urethelial carcinoma, high-grade urethelial carcinoma, and low-grade urethelial neoplasm. Just a couple of things I want to uh, stop here and uh, remind you. Uh, one is that uh, in order to call a specimen unsatisfactory or non-diagnostic, uh, clearly you need some adequacy criteria. Um, and this also depends on the type of the urine sample that you have. So in our institution, we mostly do instrumented urines. And with instrumented urines, you really want to make sure that you actually see these cells. Uh, otherwise, why do they instrument it? So in other words, it's a forced exfoliative specimen. And the adequacy criteria um, in the Paris system is about 2,600 cells um, in a sample, in a thin prep sample. So that would mean about two cells uh, per high power field times 10 high power fields. That would make it adequate. Now, what would it be for uh, voided urine samples? So there has been some studies on this, and there's actually continued studies. Uh, one that came out of Hopkins actually recommends that voided urine samples uh, should be non-diluted uh, samples for about 30 milliliters. Now, you might say, well, what if I got 20 milliliters and I still have cells in them? Well, that would still be adequate. So this means if you're looking at the slide, there are absolutely no cells in it. And say you have only 10 milliliters of urine, or say you have 20 milliliters of urine, but it is diluted with a fixative uh, and you don't see any cells. Well, that would be the time to call avoided urine sample uh, unsatisfactory or inadequate or non-diagnostic. Um, the second one is the negative for high-grade urethelial carcinoma. This is to remind us that if you have a reason uh, for cells to look somewhat different, like polyoma virus or other virus cytopathic effects, or um, chunks of cells that we see, chunks of groups of cells, like tissue fragments that we see in urolithiasis, these are all negative for urethelial carcinoma or the chemotherapy effect and so forth. Um, these wouldn't make it to atypical. Atypical and suspicious, we're going to go into in a little bit. I'm going to jump to the low-grade urethelial neoplasm here. Um, notice it says low-grade urethelial neoplasm and not low-grade urethelial carcinoma. Um, why? Uh, because in urine cytology, uh, you see the cells that are lining these papillary structures. Uh, most of the times, you don't see the fibrovascular cores. The cells lining these papillary structures are very similar to normal urethelial cells. Um, and you cannot make a difference between them, between, say, papilloma or um, palm lump, papillary urethelial neoplasm um, of unknown malignant potential, or um, low grade papillary carcinoma, papillary urethelial carcinoma. So, therefore, this is the combined terminology given to all these um, low-grade papillary structures, low-grade urethelial neoplasm. We're going to go into that in a little bit too. Uh, but really, what is the basis of this Paris system? And the basis is that this is um, high-grade urethelial carcinoma. The detection of the high-grade urethelial carcinoma is the most important. As you know, these low-grade lesions or neoplasms um, could have recurrence, but more than often, they're not going to be invading. However, high-grade urethelial carcinoma or carcinoma in situ uh, may um, invade, may metastasize, and this has associated um, higher uh, mortality and morbidity. Uh, therefore, this is really the feature to detect. And also, morphologically, this is something that for sure we can detect. So. Um, this uh, next flowchart is a flowchart um, I developed uh, just to make it easier in, in our laboratory, and then we published in a couple of places. Uh, it helps us to give a uh, easy approach to urinary cytology. So let's look at this. Is there any atypia? If there's no atypia, we go down this route. Are there any fibrovascular cores? No, there are no fibrovascular cores and nothing in the endoscopy, radiology, clinical impression, then that leads us down to the negative tract. 
However, if there are fibrovascular cores that we could see and the atypia is non-existent or very, very mild, then low-grade urothelial neoplasm would be our diagnosis. Now, if there is atypia, and what do we mean by atypia? If the nuclear cytoplasmic ratio is higher than 0 0.5, meaning the surface area of the nuclei is occupying more than 50% of the surface area of the cell. In addition to at least one of these features, hypochromasia, coarse chromatin, or irregular chromatinic rim, then there is mild atypia, and we can call this atypical urothelial cells present. If the degree of atypia is more, it's severe, meaning um, there is at a minimum of 0 0.5, but yet there's more than 0 0.7 um, uh, of the nuclear cytoplasmic ratio. In addition to hyperchromasia, these are the two musts. And plus, in addition to these two, there's coarse chromatin and irregular chromatinic rim. And there is a couple of cells. There's less than five or 10 cells, then it would be suspicious. But if it's more than 10 cells, it would be considered a high-grade urothelial carcinoma. So this is, would be really kind of the basic, easy way approach to uh, urine cytology. And uh, this is important because um, according to what we give in the category, the risk of malignancy changes. Um, if you will, when you think of uh, gynecologic cytology, when you think of ASCOs, atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance, you're thinking there could be a low grade in there. However, there just wasn't enough to get to that. Um, however, um, if you're thinking of an ASCH, atypical squamous cells, high grade cannot be ruled out, you're thinking of a high grade urothelial carcinoma. Now, when it comes to urine cytology, if you're saying that there's atypical urothelial cells, you're saying quantitatively and qualitatively, I could not get to a high-grade urothelial carcinoma diagnosis. And yet, I am still worried about this. And this actually shows in the risk of malignancy, where the negative for high-grade urothelial carcinoma risk would be up to 10%. The AUC risk could be up to 35, and the numbers are, are coming on as more, more uh, TPAs papers are published. Now, going back uh, to the PAP example, high grade or suspicious for high grade urothelial carcinoma, you think of, again, high grade urothelial carcinoma. There's a risk, but maybe quantitatively I couldn't get there, which is why you see the risk of malignancy being way higher. So again, in PAPS, ASCUS pertains to low grade, ASCH pertains to high grade, still, uh, whereas in the Paris system, both AUC and suspicious for high-grade urothelial carcinoma pertain to the high-grade urothelial carcinoma categories. Now, let's do a poll here. How is urine cytology reported in your laboratory? And we have answers, parasystem with your own modification, your own system, but you don't process urine cytology and you're not sure. So um, the original attendees, about 60% of them said that they use the Paris system. Uh, another 20% said that they use a Paris system with their own modifications, and um, and then less numbers of uh, uh, individuals or uh, participants saying that they have their own system. So that was high-grade urothelial carcinoma, and as promised, I have some artwork between our cases. This is from my 16-year-old daughter. Case number two is a 72-year-old gentleman. He presents for evaluation and management of gross hematuria and urinary incontinence. He does have a history of prosthetic adenocarcinoma, and what we present here is the bladder barbitage specimen. So here we have uh, two images. Image number one, we see a cluster of urothelial cells with uh, somewhat higher NC ratio. Uh, the cells don't happen to be very hyperchromatic. Uh, they do have an open chromatin pattern. Some of the other cells have more ample cytoplasm, so the NC ratio hovers around 0 0.5. There's an intermingling of neutrophils, and um, why am I showing the neutrophils here and some lymphocytes? Typically, when you see inflammatory cells, um, think of it in surgical pathology or in other uh, areas, um, you think more of reactive changes. So 
oh, if you have this much neutrophils, you're thinking, could this be reactive? However, the NC ratio is high. So let's look at some other areas. In another area, we see some nuclear contour abnormality. And maybe a prominent nucleoli here. Some of the cells, again, the nucleus is enlarged. Here's uh, a umbrella cell for comparison. Um, again, prominent nucleoli here, you see, nucleus enlarged, mild chromasia, hyperchromasia, irregular nuclear contours, but association with uh, neutrophils. Is this reactive or is this something to worry about? And here's another cell we could see again, some neutrophils, but NC ratio is relatively higher. Although there's some degeneration in the uh, cytoplasm, the uh, nucleus is hyperchromatic. And here we actually see an umbrella cell and some normal appearing urethelial cells in the background. So what is your diagnosis? Would you think it's negative? Is this polyoma? Is this atypical, suspicious, or is it high grade? Let's see what the attendees said. So about 48, 49% of the attendees were worried about a uh, atypical uh, diagnosis, atypical urethelial cells. Um, followed by negative and suspicious, and there's some high grades and some negative. So it's really pretty well dispersed, except the vast majority are worried about a, a typical urethelial cell diagnosis. Let's see if they were right. Actually, that is exactly what I had called it. And uh, again, let's go through it one more time. One is that the NC ratio was high, okay? Um, two, some of the other cells had some hyperchromatic areas, some prominent nucleoli, and some of the cells had nuclear contour abnormalities. Now, remember what we said, to call something suspicious or high grade, you had to have a NC ratio of 0 0.7 and higher, and also you had to have hyperchromasia in addition to either a coarse chromatin pattern or irregular nuclear contours. So this didn't quite raise that, get to that level. Um, however, this clearly didn't look normal. So the differential for me was, this, is this really atypical or is this something going on? It was an older gentleman who had a history of prostate cancer. I was worried um, that something bad could come from this. So again, let's see what are the criteria. Let's repeat the criteria for atypical urethelial cells. We're looking at non-superficial and non-degenerated urethelial cells with a high nuclear uh, cytoplasmic ratio greater than 0 0.5. And in addition to, we want to see either hyperchromasia and how do we define the hyperchromasia compared to the umbrella cells or the uh, adjacent intermediate uh, squamous cell nucleus. Um, and we also want to see either clumpy or clumped chromatin or irregular nuclear contours. So our case actually jives with this. We do see higher NC ratio and some hyperchromasia and some chromatin uh, irregular nuclear contours. So now a little bit more story on this. Uh, two years before the urine cytology sample, the patient actually had a history of uh, a bladder biopsy and the diagnosis was non-invasive, low-grade urethelial carcinoma. What you see here is the uh, fibrovascular core um, covered with these uh, epithelial cells that are um, relatively uniform. You don't see pleomorphism or hyperchromasia, and um, you know, non-invasive, low-grade urethelial carcinoma. The fish test was positive, which you could see in low grades. Uh, and um, as a side note, Umbrella cells could be uh, positive for the Eurovision fish test too, uh, because you could see multinucleation. So, um, so you might say, well, Dr. Barkin, why was this not a low grade? Why didn't you call this low grade? Was this a low grade or else? So what you see here um, is a um, picture of a fibrovascular core. If you look carefully, you see the red blood cells and the fibrovascular core going through the middle of that cluster. And they're all lined with these um, urethelial cells that look like maybe intermediate or basal urethelial cells. Now here's a cell block where you can actually nicely see the fibrovascular core in the center, again, lined by these urethelial cells on the surface. So how would you make a diagnosis of this? Unless you see a true fibrovascular core like you see it in these two pictures, 
you cannot really make a diagnosis of low-grade urothelial neoplasm. Again, let me correct this. It's low-grade urothelial neoplasm, and it's not low-grade urothelial carcinoma in urine cytology samples. Uh, of course, there's other thoughts about this. Is this truly a carcinoma? Um, the molecular findings of this low-grade lesion, which is a total different topic of another um, webinar. Um, <clears throat> but the take-home point is our particular sample didn't have any fibrovascular cores um, and um, just had some of these mild atypia. Uh, and therefore, it wasn't um, right to call it Logan. Now, a couple weeks after the original urine cytology sample, there was another urine cytology sent to us. And in that particular sample, what we saw was these urothelial cells with relatively high NC ratio. This time, they're more than 0 0.7. As you could see, they are hyperchromatic. There's coarse chromatin pattern. Uh, and you could see some prominent nucleoli. In fact, you see the nucleoli almost as um, large as the um, next door neutrophils. And here's a neutrophil nuclei here, and they're almost as the same size as the prominent nucleoli. So this was actually a high-grade urothelial carcinoma, and that would be the follow-up. Um, and for gold standard, we don't necessarily need surgical pathology. If you see uh, something like this, it is high-grade urothelial carcinoma. And then um, a month after this urine cytology, they actually did a transurethral resection, where in these pictures, you could see the high-grade urothelial carcinoma cells invading into the uh, lamina propria. Some of these cells also have some clear cytoplasm, uh, and then there's areas of necrosis too. So this is a high-grade, invasive high-grade urothelial carcinoma. Well, since we're from Chicago, I thought I'd throw a Chicago artwork in there too. There we go. All right, case number three. Now, this time we are uh, with a 62-year-old uh, woman who presents to the emergency department because of gross hematuria and um, severe anemia. She also has hypertension. Now, the first picture here is a cystoscopy sample where you see these um, nodules protruding into the lumina of the bladder. A uh, normal bladder would look more um, white and pinkish and smooth, and this definitely is not normal. You have some uh, lesion there, a mass protrusion in there. And you see the um, image, the radiology image, where you see actually the, uh, uh, the bladder lining is thickened. And again, you see the mass lesion protruding into the uh, bladder lumina. So here are a couple of pictures of our uh, bladder barbitized sample. Now, this wasn't a very, very cellular sample. However, you could still see um, rare cells. Some of them are dispersed. Some of them are coming out in clusters. Uh, you see these cells um, have some varying sizes, but they're actually relatively small. When you have a neutrophil or maybe a lymphocyte in the background, it's about just a little bit larger than those. Uh, you do see um, not much of a cytoplasm. And then you have a uh, kind of a stippled chromatin pattern in some of these. Uh, some of the chromatin is also open. Again, these are two clusters uh, where um, it's a little tighter cluster uh, with the uh, cells with uh, very high NC ratio and not much of a cytoplasm to talk about. Same thing here. This is a larger chunk. So what is your diagnosis? Is this negative, atypical, is this malignant? If it's malignant, what kind of malignancy is this? So here are the attendee responses. Um, the majority, or about one third of the um, attendees favored a malignancy um, other than non-hematopoietic malignancy. Um, and then there was some high-grade urothelial carcinoma followed by other malignancy favoring a hematopoietic malignancy. So what am I showing you here? I am showing you, and I'm wanting you to think about what is the differential diagnosis when you see small cells in urine? Well, normal basal or intermediate urothelial cells are smaller. Renal tubular cells are typically much less seen in uh, voided urine and also even in instrumented urine. They're very degenerated, but they could be small. Um, inflammatory cells are small, like um, lymphocytes, like follicular cystitis, 
uh, very similar to what you would see in follicular cervicitis. You see clusters of lymphocytes um, mixed with macrophages. Hematopoietic malignancy is another one. Um, could this be a lymphoma, leukemia, and so forth? Or is this just a small cell? So could this be a small cell carcinoma, perhaps? So let's look at these one by one. So these are benign basal urethelial cells and maybe some intermediate cells too. So these have a high NC ratio. You don't see much of a cytoplasm. They are very uniform, not very pleomorphic at all. You don't see mitotic figures. And you don't see a um, hyperchromatic or coarse chromatin pattern. Chromatin is open on these. Neobladder urine. So neobladder or any kind of ileal conduits. Um, these are done in patients who have high-grade urethelial carcinoma and who are not responsive to intravesical immunomodulation like BCG uh, treatment or um, chemo intravesical chemotherapy. Uh, these are um, either colon or ileal uh, uh, fragments um, made into little pouches, um, either into a neobladder where it actually sits in place um, attached to the urethra, or it could be made into a pouch where there is a um, patient has to catheterize them with, uh, intermittently to, um, to drain the urine. In either case, what we see in these samples are uh, these glandular cells, which are degenerated because they are um, in a very um, acidic environment due to the urine, and you see all these degenerated glandular cells. They're relatively smaller cells, and you see all these small uh, melamed Wolinska bodies in here too. Uh, these little red things are the melamed Wolinska bodies, uh, incidentally. Uh, they were described by uh, Melamed and Wolinska in 1960s uh, and its publication in Acta Cytologica. Uh, another one would be um, endometriosis. These are smaller cells. Again, they come out in clusters, very similar to what you would see, um, uh, like endometrial cells in the uh, pap test. You see these clusters coming. This would be very rare, uh, and as such, it's actually a courtesy of uh, Dr. Gupta. Um, who uh, gave this picture to me, much to my delight, because we don't see uh, that much of uh, endometrial cells in urine cytology. Uh, another one would be uh, granulomas. These are, again, are very small cells. What you see, these uh, boomerang-shaped macrophages, and you see lymphocytes making these large um, clusters, um, usually circular clusters. And why would you see granulomas in the bladder? Well, most of the time you see granulomas uh, in patients who have had immunomodulant therapy like BCG treatment, um, or, or um, maybe there's an infection. Um, this would be much rarely seen. But anyway, so smaller cells, differential diagnosis. Another one would be uh, metastatic carcinoma from elsewhere. Now, this is relatively difficult to see. Um, because it's not that common at all. And it would be uh, difficult to recognize unless you have the clinical story to go along with it. Uh, what are the features? Maybe you see some intracytoplasmic mucin. Um, you see uh, small and uniform cells with higher NC ratio. Uh, you could see targetoid mucin in these. Uh, but again, if there's no clinical story, this would be very, very difficult. Uh, another unusual um, diagnosis in urine cytology would be uh, myeloid leukemia. So this, you know, clearly would be uh, seen in patients with a uh, history of myeloid leukemia. I have never really seen um, primary myeloid leukemia starting in the bladder. Um, our, this is our publication from several years ago. A patient who had a history of AML, and uh, you could see... Um, the uh, lesional cells, uh, leukemic cells, leukemic blasts, making these cells with a relatively high NC ratio, um, very irregular nuclear contours, open chromatin pattern. Um, so again, so this is one of the differential diagnoses of high-grade urethelial carcinoma, um, but relatively smaller cells. Lymphomas, again, as we said, SLL, CLL could be uh, this one, um, is a large cell lymphoma, but again, um, you could see small cell lymphomas in the bladder, um, secondary typically. So 
this case was actually a small cell carcinoma. And uh, the tip-off is probably that it's coming out in cohesive chunks and the NC ratio is very, very high. It's higher than what high-grade urothelial carcinoma would be. And also the uh, salt, salt and pepper and the coarse um, stippled pattern would be uh, the giveaways on these. And it turns out uh, on a uh, transurethral resection, here we actually see some uh, mucosa with some uh, squamous metaplasia. And undermining, we see the um, small cell carcinoma uh, positive for uh, the neuroendocrine markers. Um, in this case, probably there was an area of ulceration, and through that area of ulceration, the squamous cell carcinoma, or I'm sorry, small cell carcinoma cells fell into the uh, urine sample. So that was um, differential diagnosis of small cells in the urine. Um, so uh, this is another picture from my daughter. This is when she uh, drew her aunt who got her PhD. Trees of knowledge, I guess. Her brain was growing, that's why she drew this picture. So case number four. Uh, this is a 72-year-old gentleman. He presents with hematuria, hesitancy, urgency, and nocturia. So he has a lot of uh, urinary problems. He has bilateral hydronephrosis. So when you see hydronephrosis and bilateral hydronephrosis, clearly there's an outflow tract obstruction which really uh, jives with history because he has prosthetic hypertrophy. But then he has uh, these uh, cells in his urine cytology. And this is again a cystoscopic uh, provided bladder barbitage sample. You see these um, necrosis or maybe cellular debris in the background. Uh, you see cells coming out in clusters with very eccentrically located nuclei. Uh, again, debris in the background, and maybe you see some inflammatory cells. In other areas, you see single cells, again, very eccentrically located plasma cytoid nuclei, and you see the chromatin is dark, very hyperchromatic, same thing in here, and you see uh, other cells with some nuclear contour abnormality too. So overall, the overriding thing is that very plasmacytoid, eccentrically located, and almost like signet ring type cells. But could they be normal? Could they be reactive? These are things to think about. So what is your diagnosis? Negative, atypical, high grade, or other? Let's see what the participants said. About 66% of them said, that there was a malignancy going on, uh, but they didn't want a high-grade urothelial carcinoma. They wanted something else, like other malignancy. So these look like glandular cells in urine. And what are the differential diagnoses of glandular cells in urine? Cystitis glandularis, uh, which is just you know metaplasia, glandular metaplasia that you could see in the bladder or really anywhere along the urinary tract. Are these reactive urothelial cells? Are these umbrella cells that look somewhat um, signatoid? Um, are these allele conduit urines? Um, is this a carcinoma? And if it is, is this an adenocarcinoma? Or what else? What other malignancy is this? So let's look at these one by one. So the first one is the uh, cystitis glandularis. I showed you this picture earlier. Um, it's almost a variant of normal. You see these glandular cells uh, with uh, mucin filled, and the nucleus is really eccentrically located. Um, notice it's not really um, signity, if you will. The nuclei are round. They're not really in a crescent shape. And if you did a mucicarmine stain, um, you would see that these are actually positive for mucicarmine. Now, melanoma, you know, the great mimicker, could look like a glandular cell and could uh, give you configurations like this, where the nucleus is um, hypochromatic and it's lodged to the side in a crescent shape, um, or the nucleus is larger, again, eccentrically located. Although these have the telltale signs of melanoma with the pigmentation in the cytoplasm. Poorly differentiated urothelial carcinomas it's almost like the melanoma, kind of like the great mimicker, where you have high NC ratio, you could have multinucleation, you could have a crescent-like nuclei pushed to the side. 
um, similar to that are uracal carcinomas, and uracal carcinomas, of course, have different uh, faces to them too, but the one I'm showing you is a mucinous uh, type uracal adenocarcinoma with signet ring cell type features where you have the cytoplasm um, signetoid, uh, meaning it's eccentrically located and pushed to the very edge, almost like the nucleus is being pushed out, and you see uh, mucin uh, located in the cytoplasm as well as extracellularly too. Um, on a biopsy, here you could see actually the normal urethelial lining, and undermining the urethelium is the uh, uracal carcinoma uh, with the signet ring cell pattern here. Um, metastatic colon carcinoma, although rare, could be seen in uh, urine samples and, of course, in bladder biopsies too. And this is one of the telltale signs of how typically we would see these. Um, these are either carrot-shaped sh or pencil-shaped. They're all lined up like a picket fence. Um, they have hyperchromatic uh, nuclei, and they're associated with so-called dirty necrosis. And you can see the dirty necrosis in the background, meaning there's necrotic debris um, associated with neutrophils and so forth. So this is metastatic. Um, adenocarcinoma coming from the colon in the urinary bladder. Uh, another one um, of glandular cells would be prostatic adenocarcinoma. Now, of course, due to the close proximity of the uh, prostate to the bladder, you could have uh, direct involvement or metastasis of um, prostatic adenocarcinoma into the urinary bladder. Uh, the one telltale sign is if you're going to have prostate adenocarcinoma in the urine, they typically come out in larger or uh, clusters, larger or smaller clusters. And if you can imagine with me, you see these glandular uh, configurations, and they could be fused glands or maybe a single gland. Um, and you do see very prominent nucleoli. So if you see these glandular um, or fused glandular configurations with prominent nucleoli, please, please think of prostatic adenocarcinoma as a differential diagnosis. Now, in this case, if you're worried about prostate cancer, what you can do is a cell block, and you could uh, do your prostatic stains. So what would be these? This would be PSA, PSAP, and maybe NKX 3.1, which is also a very good stain to differentiate prostate cancer. If if it's urothelial, it's going to be GATA3 positive or P40 or P63 positive, and that would really help you differentiate these. Um, before I pass on, um, sometimes people ask, do we do um, cell blocks on all urine cytology cases? And the answer is no. We do uh, cell blocks in about maybe less than 5%, about 2% of the cases. The times that you want to do a cell block is if you're seeing something like this, where it doesn't quite fit the diagnosis of high-grade urothelial carcinoma, and you're thinking of a different malignancy, and you would try to identify if uh, maybe is there a prostate cancer or colon cancer or some other kind of neoplasm in there. So that would be the one time to do the cell block. Another time would be if you are thinking that you might see Pseudo papillary clusters that you're thinking it could be a low grade, that would be another time to do a uh, cell block where you can actually see the um, papillary configurations in the cell block. Um, other than that, uh, we do not recommend doing cell blocks on routinely on urine cytology samples. Now, the diagnosis of this case was actually a signet ring cell carcinoma because the patient, uh, I didn't tell you, I'm sorry, uh, the patient actually had a history of a signet ring cell type poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma of the rectum. And uh, then he uh, had an uh, invasion into the urinary bladder. And where, what you see here is a urinary bladder biopsy where the um, surface appears uninvolved, benign urethelium, but the undermining it are these um, signet ring cell type cells uh, with, uh, and, and they're positive for mucicarmine, uh, CK20, CDX2. Um, so this was actually a metastatic um, or recurrent signet ring cell carcinoma um, involving the uh, rectum as well as the bladder. So tough case. Um, for those of you who like tables, I threw a table in there. So adenocarcinomas of the bladder, uh, could this uh, help? Um, 
So if you're thinking of prosthetic adenocarcinoma, that would be the easiest one because it's positive for PSA, PSAP, and KX3.1. Now, uh, the poorly differentiated the prosthetic adenocarcinoma is, the less likely that it might be PSA or PSAP positive. I think, uh, in my experience at least, one of the last markers uh, to stay positive, even in poorly differentiated prosthetic carcinomas, is the NKX3.1. Uh, when it comes to differentiating the adenocarcinomas of the bladder versus colonic type adenocarcinomas, uh, unfortunately, um, it really doesn't help to have um, CK20, which could be positive in all. CDX2 could be also positive in all. And um, then there are uh, other markers, uh, and beta-catenin is one of them. That could uh, possibly be helpful because uh, beta-catenin is typically positive in um, primary colorectal carcinomas compared to uh, the uh, there's nuclear positivity compared to the primary bladder adenocarcinomas. Um, another one is maybe the SAT B2 stain, but the SAT B2 stain um, stains both colorectal carcinomas as well as primary bladder adenocarcinomas. So that uh, won't really help too much in differentiating the two too. Um, of course, this is all very nice, but what you should do is look up the clinical history, and if the patient has a history of colorectal primary, then you might not even need to do any of these. Okay, slowly coming back home, picture of Istanbul and the Marmara Sea. And case number five, which is a 49-year-old uh, lady, and she has a history of diabetes and hypertension. She presents with hematuria. She does have a filling defect in the renal pelvis, and she also has a cyst in the um, left kidney. So what they did was a right renal pelvis washing and brushing. So this is selective cytology coming from the renal pelvis uh, with the brushing. So let's look at some pictures. So what we see here, is a relatively large sheet of cells that somewhat look uniform. And you see single cells in the background. And when you see the single cells in the background, they do have you know, ample cytoplasm. And uh, the cells that are on top of one another, it's difficult to say about the NC ratios and so forth because you don't see the cytoplasm clearly. But when you look at another image with the uh, cluster, you see, again, there's ample cytoplasm, maybe um, NC ratio of 0 0.5 or so. Uh, there's minimal hyperchromasia, uh, no pleomorphism, um, no mitotic figures. Uh, another area actually shows the fibrovascular core beautifully. So we have fibrovascular cores, large chunks of uh, cells, um, that are somewhat uniform, they're not pleomorphic, we don't see mitotic figures. So what do you think the diagnosis is? So we have negative, um, atypical, high grade, and low gun, L gun. So it looks like the vast majority, uh, about yeah, three quarters of the uh, attendees uh, voted for ALGAN. And remember, ALGAN stands for low-grade urothelial neoplasm. So why was this? Because we saw the fibrovascular cores. And because the cells in the background did not have features of high-grade urothelial carcinoma, meaning the um, hyperchromasia, the very high NC ratio, the coarse chromatin, and the irregular chromatinic rim. What are the differential diagnosis of papillary groups in the um, urine cytology? So if you see pseudo-papillary groups, I should have actually said, uh, instrumentation artifact could cause pseudo-papillary groups. Why? You're putting an instrument um, up, say, the ureter, and then you're passing it through a very narrow mucosa, and therefore the mucosa is being rubbed and some tissue fragments come off. Uh, urolithiasis, again, there's a stone rubbing onto the mucosa, and then you have tissue fragments coming off. And of course, the low-grade papillary urothelial neoplasms, which include the papilloma pulmon and the low-grade urothelial carcinoma. So 
again from Kwas, uh, one of the fathers of uh, uh, modern urine cytology. Cytology is not suitable for differentiating between instrumentation, lithiasis, and low-grade papillary tumors. So you really can't look at this and call this a papilloma or a pun lump and so forth based on urine cytology. However, you can for sure diagnose, is it high-grade or is it low-grade? So here's again a beautiful fibrovascular core right in the middle going through the pictures, and you see the lining cells. Uh, that have a uh, relatively lower nuclear cytoplasmic ratio. Granted, they have tails, but they have a lot of cytoplasm, and they are very uniform. So this would be an Elgon diagnosis. Now, um, this patient um, had a uh, nephrectomy, a nephroureterectomy, because of the um, lesion, low-grade papillary urothelial carcinoma. And here, actually, you see this. Um, lesion where they had previously given us selective cytology or renal pelvic brushing from. Right here was our diagnosis. Um, otherwise, the kidney didn't have any other abnormalities. Just a little bit about upper tract. Now, um, as of the Paris system, the first edition, the criteria doesn't change in the upper tract. Um, there are studies being done. Uh, one once it comes out, perhaps things will uh, uh, make it into the TPS 2.0. There are some studies showing that the upper tract uh, urothelial cells are slightly smaller than the lower tract cells. So that's one thing, perhaps. However, when you look at the high-grade urothelial carcinomas in the upper tract and the lower tract, they look alike with high NC ratio and hyperchromasia and irregular contours and so forth. Now, one thing to be aware of is the upper tract brushing samples tend to be very cellular. It's not only forced exfoliative, but also brush bristles are being used. So um, if they are very cellular, and just because they are cellular doesn't mean that they're going to be uh, positive. Uh, again, remember, just seeing tissue fragments uh, does not make uh, it atypical or high-grade or suspicious. In these cases, cell blocks could be useful, um, especially if we're thinking of a Elgon case, uh, and uh, we could see the papillary configurations better in the cell block. Again, I'm not recommending doing cell blocks in all these upper tract cases, but in select cases where you're worried uh, morphologically as well as clinically. Now, <clears throat> of course, knowledge of the endoscopy, meaning the uh, ureteroscopy or cystoscopy, and the radiologic impression may aid in the diagnosis. So if you have access to the electronic medical record, please, please look at these um, cases and put everything together before you come to a final diagnosis. And um, to tell our urologists, typically concomitant surgical pathology and uh, cytology increases the sensitivity and accuracy um, according to uh, the publications that we have done prior to this. Uh, because the surgical pathology is going to be a very small sample, uh, the um, uh, biopsy equipment or the alligator is very small and it can take only small bites. Surgical pathology is typically not that good in the upper tracts. However, cytology with the brushing and the widespread washing, not only it gets a larger area of uh, sampling, but also it gets intact and uh, good specimen material, uh, sufficient specimen material to evaluate um, that if there's a high-grade urothelial carcinoma or not. And the last point is uh, selective cytology, meaning upper tract cytology, uh, is better than voided uh, urine in detecting upper tract urothelial carcinoma. And what do I mean by this? If you had two samples, say you had a voided urine and you had a uh, brushing of a renal pelvis sample of a patient who had an upper tract lesion, which one gets the best material to arrive to that diagnosis? Obviously, it's going to be the selective cytology of the upper tract where you can actually directly brush the sample. Um, otherwise, you're waiting for these cells to fall into the urine and then make their way into the bladder and so forth. Okay, we're getting toward the very end of this. And this is for me to um, remind you that actually uh, Paris System 2.0 is coming. Now we already have a group, and this is a picture of part of the group, and uh, it's actually a growing group now. And uh, we're hoping to get all the publications on the Paris System 
and put it together to make it even more user friendly and even more accurate uh, with the second uh, edition. So this is a good time to think about your Incitology uh, projects and get them published so we can use them in the uh, Paris System 2.0 book. Um, the last thing I want to show you is actually a um, plug-in for the World Vision Cytology Contest. So this is something we're doing at our annual meeting. And the idea is a global outreach for the ASC, for the American Society of Cytopathology. We want to reach out to everybody in the world to see if they have an interesting case, if they have a um, perhaps a local case that they want to um, submit to us. Um, and uh, share it with the rest of the ASC. We are very happy to do that. Um, this is about a contest that will happen in the um, annual meeting. It will be about um, maybe a two-hour session, and we will have five finalists. So of the people who um, um, send our uh, send their applications, we will pick the top five. And then we will have the top five uh, presenting at our annual meeting. So think about it. And for more information, you can go to cytopathology.org. Um, now, there was a couple of questions that came in uh, during the um, original webinar. So I'm going to go through those questions, too, and uh, see if I can answer those questions. Um, and maybe you have questions like that. Feel free to write to me. Um, from my email, which is gbarkin at lumc.edu. Oh, or you can uh, follow me and um, send a direct message or just uh, tweet me at, at barkin ga. Um, either one of them, you could do that too. But let's look at some of these questions. So one of these questions was, how do you differentiate Elgon in an instrumented catheterized specimen? So the answer is you really can't. If you have pseudo-papillary clusters, this could be due to instrumentation artifact, like catheterization or urolithiasis, or it could be an Elgon. The only time that you know for sure that this is a true papillary um, lesion uh, a low-grade through papillary lesion is that if you have a fibrovascular core. If you don't have a fibrovascular core, you really can't uh, make that diagnosis. Um, another question is uh, about studies looking at the upper tract and uh, doing some NC ratio cutoffs. Could we? Um, could this be changed in the Paris 2.0? Uh, yes, truly, there are some studies looking at the NC ratio cutoffs. In fact, uh, nowadays, um, what is recommended or what, what the papers are showing is that uh, anything above a uh, NC ratio of 0 0.5 and higher, both on the lower tract and the upper tract, is showing that this could be carcinoma, meaning from the NC ratio, we might be reducing this from 0 0.7 to 0 0.5. Uh, but this is something to be seen in the TPS. Uh, when it comes into being, and hopefully maybe within a year or so, this um, the new atlas will be out. Um, uh, there was another question about ancillary studies, um, such as Eurovision or the role of molecular studies. So really the best um, gold standard for uh, detecting high-grade urothelial carcinomas is urine cytology and cystoscopy. Uh, there are no um, magic bullet molecular tests detecting this, including Eurovision. Now, Eurovision, of course, does detect um, high-grade urothelial carcinoma and also low-grade, but it also has uh, false positives. So if a urine cytology is negative, or if it's suspicious or atypical, we already have a diagnosis. In fact, if it's suspicious, it means that there probably is urothelial carcinoma. Maybe it's coming from the upper tract or elsewhere. We need to find where it's coming from. Um, the only use could be in specific scenarios in atypical urine cytology. And with that, um, according to a couple of studies, including ours, the false positive rate is high, um, close to almost 50% of these Eurovision uh, studies. So, um, and if 
in a case of atypical, if your revision test is negative, this shouldn't really give false security that there is nothing. Um, the patient still needs to be followed up. So only in selected situations of atypical cytology could Eurovision be useful in this case. Um, another question is when should we make cell blocks? And as I said, the cases to make cell blocks is if that we're thinking of we're seeing fibrovascular cores or uh, we're seeing pseudopapillary clusters and you're worried about LGUN, that would be a good time. So that's number one. Number two is you're seeing um, neoplastic cells, but you're not quite sure if they're high grade and you have differential diagnosis like carcinomas from elsewhere or lymphoma or melanoma and you want to do stains, this would be the time to do stains. Um, and you would do the stains only on the cell block. Um, I would recommend not doing stains in other instances, uh, in other um, specimen types like um, thin prep or sure path because they are in fixatives and whenever these cells are in fixative they uh, their antigenicity does change um, and typically these stains are uh, validated on formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissue and therefore doing it in other fixatives uh, would uh, give uh, false positives or false negatives um, so do these immunostochemical stains only in cell blocks and do the cell blocks only if you're thinking of a algon or a malignancy other than high-grade urothelial carcinoma. Uh, another question, what do urologists do when they have an atypical diagnosis on urine cytology? So prior to the Paris system, when they got the atypical diagnosis, uh, urologists really didn't, um, let's say, politically correct, didn't care too much about that diagnosis. They thought this was more of an issue created by the pathologist and that probably it was negative. So whatever they would do on a negative case is what they would do on an atypical case. Now with the Paris system and the uh, publications coming off the, uh, after the uh, Paris system, you see that the neg negative predictive value uh, for uh, or the positive predictive value for uh, negative category, the negative for high-grade urothelial carcinoma category is about 10%, meaning only about 0 to 10% of the time you have a high-grade urothelial carcinoma once you have a diagnosis um, in the negative category, as opposed to when you look at the high-grade or the atypicals, when you have a diagnosis of AUC, the outcome uh, ranges anywhere between 10 to about 50 percent. Uh, that means the urologist actually has to do something about these and this would be um, calling the patient and maybe um, monitoring them every uh, six months or so uh, to make sure that you know we're not missing something. Of course this is not, not dependent on the urine cytology, it depends on the uh, patient um, history, um, the uh, radiologic findings, the cystoscopic findings, and so forth. Uh, but bottom line is when there's a diagnosis of atypical, this is nothing to ignore. This is something needs to be done. Um, there's another question about could SAT B2 used in cases uh, with colorectal origin uh, to differentiate between uh, colonic and primary bladders? carcinomas? And the answer is not really because primary bladder adenocarcinomas could be uh, SAT B2 positive also, although lower percent of the time, so that doesn't necessarily help. Um, similar to that, uh, GATA3 could be positive in um, adenocarcinomas of the um, uh, bladders, but it also could be positive in, say, uh, metastatic breast carcinomas. So maybe in given clinical scenarios, using a immunostochemical pattern uh, would help. Uh, but more so than that, Really, it is important to know the clinical history um, when you're differentiating a, um, uh, say, malignancy or carcinoma other than urothelial carcinoma. Uh, and if there is previous uh, material, definitely do the uh, picture matching uh, and be judicious with your immunostochemical usage. If it looks like um, the colonic carcinoma from the rectum and it's within the two years, odds are that is what it is. 
Um, question was, another question is, what is selective cytology? Uh, with selective cytology, I mean cytology uh, of the uh, different locations like the upper tract, for instance, the brushings of the renal pelvis or the ureter, or maybe urethral brushing would be a selective cytology compared to avoided urine, where you're actually doing cytology of the entire um, urinary tract. Uh, there's another question about how often are we preparing cell blocks? We prepare cell blocks uh, not very often. In fact, uh, about maybe 2 or 3% of the time. It's definitely less than 5%. Uh, another question is how do you deal with degenerated cells with high NC ratio and hyperchromasia with positive cystoscopy? So this is a very good question. How do you deal with degeneration? So you have avoided urine, the cells are degenerated. If it has the features of high NC ratio, and hyperchromasia, um, and say there are rare cells and they're all degenerated, this would be more um, in line with a suspicious for high-grade urothelial carcinoma, and you can put a comment in there saying that um, you know, you're highly uh, worried about a high-grade urothelial carcinoma, but the uh, paucity um, of the cells and the degeneration precludes a, a definitive diagnosis. And, um, and trust me, the urologist will get the message that really you're thinking of a high grade, but because of the degeneration, you're kind of going uh, back. Um, another question is, for suspicious for high-grade urothelial carcinoma, the book says it's uh, the NC ratio is more than 0 0.5 to 0 0.7, uh, but you know the presentation said 0 0.7, and all the publications are saying 0 0.7. So this will definitely change in the Paris 2.0. We hope to change some of that um, to make it more uh, streamlined. Um, so uh, yeah, it will be better, hopefully. Now, uh, there's a good question asking about what should a lab's atopia rate be? Uh, this is very, very good. So imagine this. You're a urologist, and about 50% of the time, you're getting an atypical diagnosis. Now, how would that make you feel? Would you want to just uh, flip a coin instead of send your urine cytology to your cytopathologist? Well, I would. That is a very, very high rate. So when you look at the publication, the pre-Paris publications, um, the rate of um, atypia ranges between 2 to about 50%. That is huge. First of all, it's a huge range. Secondly, 50% is a huge, huge number for atypia. So as a rule of thumb, in any given cytology sample, your atypia rate should not be any more than 10%. There's a couple of things you have to think about. Now, why are you calling this atypia? Are you unsure? Is it qualitatively or quantitatively? Are you unsure? Um, are you uncomfortable with that specimen type? So those are the times, and again, Atypia is a whole uh, different webinar in itself, in general, the approach to it, the psychological approach to it, and so forth. But if you are feeling uncomfortable and you want to call it atypical, I think the idea is to maybe show it around to your colleagues to see if you can reduce the atypia. Again, rule of thumb around 10%. Uh, when we look at the Paris atypia rates, uh, or the urine atypia rates following the Paris system, almost all laboratories um, dropped the atypia rates, and um, some of them were able to drop it huge numbers from, say, like um, 30 percent to 10 percent. Some of them are smaller numbers from 10 to 5 or so. Uh, but really, every laboratory was able to drop their atypia rate. Um, and uh, in, in our own laboratory, it hovers around 5 percent now. And the rule is, if anyone wants to call something atypical, we show it to another person. And then we, maybe we can downgrade it to a, a negative or we can upgrade it to something else by um, multi-scoping these cases. Um, do you have any problems with lubricant blocking the filter with thin prep technique is another question. This is an excellent question. And um, our cytology supervisor, Grazina Chat, would love you for asking this question because, yes, occasionally we do have questions. Uh, and issues about this. Um, and this typically is because either they're using the wrong kind of lubricants that um, are not hologic recommended, or it could be because maybe we have somebody new and maybe they're using a little bit more lubricants. Um, now, you have to understand when you're doing an instrumented urine sample, um, 
you know, you're doing cystoscopy and using no lubricant would be somewhat painful to the patient. However, um, we have to talk to our urologists and our urology nurses to reduce this. And this is exactly what we did in our institution when we had this problem. Talk to the urologist. And also we had a meeting with the um, um, urology nurses and we showed them pictures of um, what you would see in a normal urine cytology sample and what if uh, you had a lot of lubricant. And um, we showed them the purple blobs and said these purple blobs are covering all these cells and we don't know what they are, meaning the cells that are hidden by the lubricant. So we said, could you please use less of this? And it helped. So communication seems to help with this particular um, problem in here. Um, another question is, do you get clusters of atypical cells in AUC or is it just single cells? So the answer is it could be single cells or it could be clusters. Just because you're seeing clusters of cells doesn't make it atypical. However, if you're seeing clusters of cells and within the cluster you're seeing the criteria of atypia, meaning high NC ratio, um, 0.5 and higher, hypochromasia, coarse chromatin, and so forth, then you can call it atypical. Um, you could see it in single cells also. Another question is, is there a difference between bladder washing and post-cystoscopy urine samples? And the answer is no. Um, if the patient had cystoscopy and then uh, gave urine sample, you could uh, see um, similar features, meaning it's more cellular. Perhaps there might be a little bit of a more degeneration in the post-cystoscopy urine samples, but um, it would be very difficult to differentiate between these two for all intents and purposes. They would look very much alike. Um, how many urine samples do you recommend in a suspected case? So this is also a good question. It depends on what urine uh, sample that you're getting. If you're getting a voided sample, of course, just near, merely mathematically or statistically, if you get more urine samples, your chances of catching the carcinoma would be higher. Uh, the book knowledge says that you could get three in a row and you don't want the first morning urine sample because that's going to be degenerated because it's sat in the body in uh, body temperature for a long period of time. So uh, three samples if it's voided. However, if it's instrumented urine, uh, usually one sample should be enough. And I think that really answers almost all the questions. And I thank you very much for uh, registering on our system. I thank you very much for following our um, YouTube channel, Cytopath1951. Um, thank you for um, being interested in cytology. I wish you all um, a being safe um, and social distancing in this time. And uh, um, well, hope to see you again. Bye for now.